Welcome, everybody, to our online debate on uh, greenish bonds. Um, I'm Thorsten Beck. I'm uh, currently professor of banking and finance uh, at the Business School formerly Cars in London. And starting next Monday, I will be the, uh, the new director of the France School of Banking and Finance. Um, this is a very important, very exciting event that we're having today, a very exciting topic. Um, you can look at it from uh, different ways. Uh, you can look at it from the viewpoint that uh, green bonds are a relatively new instrument starting in 2007. But um, now, uh, by the end of uh, last year, the cumulative uh, green bond issuance exceeded already $1 trillion. Uh, Might still be small on a big scale, but uh, certainly an upward trend. Of course, the other way to look at it is this is part of the overall um, tendency to focus more on environmental climate change issues, uh, where we shouldn't see the financial sector simply as an impediment, as some people might see them, but also as an enabler, as to how can we use the power of the financial sector to contribute to a cleaner environment and to, uh, uh, to mitigating uh, the impact um, of uh, climate change. So um, to uh, talk about this topic, we're going to have, uh, we, will, we have two exciting speakers, uh, two very uh, well-versed, very competent speakers, um, which I'm, whom I'm going to introduce in, uh, in just a moment. Um, however, before actually I go into that, um, let me just mention a, brief, a, a couple of additional activities that we have here at the, the Florence School uh, of Banking and Finance. Um, because one of the, um, the, um, the important uh, things I want like to mention is that this seminar can also be seen as kind of an entry point for a um, climate risk academy that we have in uh, just a little bit more than uh, two months, um, where you can gain, uh, together with Oliver Wyman, where you can gain uh, many more additional insights, uh, not only on green bonds, but many as other aspects of, uh, um, uh, of climate risk. Um, now, this uh, is only one of our many training activities. Um, we have a Bank Resolution Academy, um, still with a few spots, um, AML, um, MIFID, um, and also um, a FinTech. We have currently actually a FinTech Academy going on, um, but we have another one uh, coming up in September. And of course, uh, not uh, to forget that we have lots of uh, online seminars, uh, the next one actually being in uh, uh, just at, um, in a few weeks, uh, uh, part of our Bank Board Academy, uh, which is a new initiative we have. Um, and we're gonna talk uh, about uh, um, low interest rates for long, and of course, not just the implication, the general implication, but especially uh, what does it also imply for non-executive bank board members that are supposed to monitor um, uh, bank executives. But coming back to our um, uh, current topic uh, and uh, coming back to our two excellent speakers, uh, we're going to have first, uh, we're going to hear first from Justin Niebol, um, who is the deputy CEO of the Climate Bond Initiative. And uh, Justin has a long career in uh, uh, on the more the, the policy side of, uh, of climate uh, finance, of climate change more generally, also on green bonds, um, also with a focus uh, on uh, emerging markets. Um, and then second, um, we have uh, Gianfranco Gianfatte, who is a associate professor of finance at Etic uh, Business School in France. And he has also talked uh, quite a lot, uh, he has written and researched quite a lot about this uh, topic um, um, of uh, climate change finance, but also other related topics such as innovation financing um, uh, corporate uh, valuation. Um, before we get started, actually, I have a quick poll question for you, uh, somewhat provocative call, uh, uh, poll question on what is your view on this latest boom on the green bonds? Is it for reputation purposes that institutional investor want to buy them? It's an intrinsic value or it's not, uh, is it just a bubble? A bit like what people say about Bitcoin. Um, so please tell us your view. Um, and uh, then, um, well, maybe I should in the meantime, uh, let's let's wait a few more seconds. Uh, do we have already results? Yes, we do have results, wonderful. So um, what is uh, driving the current uh, green bronze, bond spree? Um, well, so institutional investors, um, the, the winner, so to say, among our audience is that uh, there's a need to hold green bonds in portfolio for reputation purposes, um, followed by uh, a third saying there's an intrinsic value to it, and there's actually also a return, given their relatively low risks. 
Um, very few say there is not really uh, that this is actually a bubble. So maybe that's uh, reassuring. Uh, but let me turn over now to Justin for the next 10 minutes just to give us a quick overview of the market and maybe also actually refer back to this, uh, to this question whether it's, uh, it's really not a bubble, it's all uh, about intrinsic and it's all about uh, the reputation. Thank you, Thorsten, for the introduction. Uh, and as I get this up and running, there we go. We should all be good to go now. So um, uh, thank you. Uh, yes, so um, just sorry, just having a few difficulties here on my computer. Right, let's dive in. Um, so yeah, my name is Justine, Deputy CEO of CBI. Apologies, just getting the technical side all up and running. Here we are. Um, well, look, I think it's quite interesting, the poll that uh, we've just heard, um, the results. I think that uh, uh, it's, it's, it definitely is driven by reputational advantage, but I'd also like to hone in on that second point around the intrinsic value. Uh, the rise of green bonds it has been quite an exceptional phenomenon in the last 10 years. Uh, of course, for our, um, our audience today, for some of you, uh, you're really just starting to dive into this market, given it's now sitting at roughly about a trillion uh, USD outstanding uh, since 2020. Uh, and so this is a product that is very much uh, around the proceeds and what they're tied to. So, uh, you know, Vanilla structures in terms of its uh, terms and, and conditions, comparable pricing, it's a both refi and, and eligible for new project investments. And, and most of what we continue to see is investment grade uh, product into the market. Of course, fundamentally, there are two, uh, two features uh, compared to its uh, vanilla counterparts. And that's uh, very much the um, eligible assets and projects that are being included that uh, are contributing positively to uh, environmental impact. Uh, predominantly climate change, of course, and minimizing risk uh, associated with climate change, but other factors as well. And of course, the transparency and disclosure element, which is about uh, how things are being financed, the reporting component, and ensuring that uh, we are delivering impact with these products. Uh, the rise of green bonds, like I said, has been exceptional uh, since 2014, appreciating that we've seen early issuances coming out of EIB and uh, World Bank is some of the first entrants into the market, uh, driven by uh, demand from European buyers, particularly in the Nordics, uh, around the need to start providing investments that allows them to start addressing risk across their portfolio relative to the non-financial risks. Uh, 2014 was very much the year of green bonds. Uh, after a notable issuance coming from IFC in 2013 uh, that really helped pioneer the market's growth. Uh, and since then, we've seen uh, a year-on-year -year, uh, growth of green bonds where um, uh, last 2019 and, and last year, we ended at around $260 billion. Uh, of course, we've also seen the rise of other thematic labels coming into the market. And of course, this has to be seen in response to uh, particularly the COVID crisis. Um, we saw a huge rise, as you can see in 2020, uh, on social pandemic and, and sustainability linked bonds and loans, which I think was quite an interesting uh, model that came into the market where uh, the investment itself is linked to clear commitment set, um, KPI set by the issuing entity, uh, achieving milestones throughout the uh, duration of the investment. Of course, for investors, as we had seen in our poll, uh, the views around reputation, of course, is one of them, but we mustn't uh, forget the risk mitigation potential here that green bonds can serve across portfolios, um, and of course, the reporting component to shareholders and so on. Uh, there's also for issuers, the investor diversification and pricing. This is fundamentally uh, a key point that we need to make sure that is understood that issuers are uh, really getting access to a new investment pool that they never had before, which is really keeping momentum of the market. But of course, what I want to kind of play out here in, in these next few minutes is, you know, we've, we've had a market evolution happen in the last uh, 10 years. Uh, the beginning of this market has very much been around the pure plays. 
uh, what we mean, hard green, uh, renewable energy assets, uh, public mass transit systems, water infrastructure that uh, uh, takes into account climate impacts, um, and of course, other areas like uh, environmental restoration, biodiversity, and so on. Um, but keep in mind that, uh, you know, this has been about a proof of concept of this market, understanding the process required in labeling debt products. Um, understanding what needs to be in, internal in terms of infrastructure and accountability for issuers and what investors are looking for and an education to the market on what we mean by green. Where the next 10 years will go is very much on transition. Uh, you will hear a lot around transition now uh, as the market is maturing. Uh, green is becoming ever so more better understood. Uh, especially with the developments of taxonomies. But if we're really going to make a difference uh, with these investments, it really has to be on targeting our high carbon emitting sectors, sectors that we are definitely need to going to rely on uh, in our future economy development. Uh, and so that will be a plethora of different ways of financing, uh, not just down to green bonds, but other labeled products. Uh, and ensuring that our investments are maintaining a 1.5 degree uh, trajectory. Um, this okay. is all can about. I, can I just ask very quickly, there's an understanding question in the, in the, in the chat. Uh, what is the difference for you for, between green bonds and sustainable bonds? Or it's just too. Um... Very good question. Uh, thanks, Thorsten. Uh, green bonds are where the assets are 100% contrib contribution to an environmental objective. Uh, sustainability will include environmental projects and assets, but it will also include social. So the sustainability is a label is indicating to investors that there are environmental and social investments in one of, of those. Um, sorry, let me go back here. Oh no. Sorry, I'm just, uh, there we go. Let me just quickly come back to this. So just to quickly say on the princi uh, principles around finance incredible transitions, um, you know, we think about transitions, investments, and we've got a sense that what this means is uh, there are still fossil fuel asset requirements of investments needed to make the transition. And what we need the market to understand that actually it's about planning, CapEx planning, new business models, understanding where high carbon emission sectors need to be in the next 10 years and planning accordingly and planning their investments accordingly, which is uh, decreasing dependency on the fossil fuel economy and contributing positively to the green economy. Um, and so just in the essence of time, uh, that's really the take home message here uh, when we're talking about transition. Um, there will be a discussion and many questions centered around the regulatory environment to this market now. Um, since 2016, we've seen a huge step up of uh, regulators, central banks uh, specifically, uh, securities and exchange commissions, um, so even in, outside of that stock exchanges that have all been stepping up to set uh, the rules of the game um, and really strong recommendations for beneficiaries to take forward. Uh, we've seen the rise of the uh, central bank network uh, with NGSF, we've seen uh, TCFD uh, requirements coming into the market and becoming adopted. Um, this is just to give you a snapshot of, of, of this becoming a global uh, development where the rules of how to issue, uh, what to issue against, uh, what is the green investment landscapes and rules of the game coming down into the national context through guidelines and frameworks that is telling issuers what, what they need to do in order to build a credible product and for investors to know uh, that due diligence has been done on these projects products. Um, of course, now there's the big discussion around taxonomy. Uh, taxonomy is uh, essentially the guide to what is uh, or what do we mean by green and sustainable. Uh, consider it a catalog of all the key economic uh, activities and sectors that we operate in in our economies. And what are the key investments to ensure that those are delivering on a climate agenda and other environmental objectives? 
The biggest advancements to this end has been in the EU, where the EU Commission, uh, as part of its sustainable action plan, finance action plan, taxonomy development was at the forefront of ensuring that the market could all sing from the same hymn sheet on what investment requirements will be needed for Europe to achieve its climate commitments. Um, and so that effect has now had uh, around the world uh, with CBI support as one of the key members of the uh, TEG for the EU Commission on Sustainable Finance Taxonomy has now been taking this around the world into other markets as you can see, uh, where there is huge demand for setting national uh, taxonomy development. At the moment, the EU and China are going through a harmonization effect across their taxonomies to align so that the capital um, flows of capital can continue uh, through the demand for green. Um, so I think this might be a good time, Thorsten, to probably pop up the um, uh, poll because I'm sure many of our listeners today have been hearing a lot about taxonomies and probably have very strong views around that. So just a simple question. Uh, for okay, sorry, uh, Christine, you already have done it, so we've been a bit ahead uh, of uh, that. Oh, uh, right. See that 73% uh, think that it's a good idea, there's a value to having national taxonomy set. Excellent. Yeah. Um, well, let me finish then in that case, and that's really good to hear because um, believe me, this is the phase <laughs> of the market where we are now. We've moved away from just simple guidelines and voluntary measures, and the regulators are stepping up now. Uh, to, to really help scale this market up. Um, so this is all about making it easy to know what to do. That is the green definitional work. Um, ensuring that we can get green funds, incentives and regulatory support in place uh, will be key. And of course, let's not forget the year that we have just passed and the year we're still in on COVID. Uh, COVID impacts around the world is creating an opportunity for us to build back better. And it will be uh, the labeled debt products and tapping into that private capital at scale to be able to achieve that successfully. And then I finish with green windows. You know, Europe has been leading the way when it comes to uh, taking initiative on setting uh, a foundation for sustainable finance. Uh, we've also seen those developments take shape in China uh, as one of the largest green bond issuers in the world. And now with the United States stepping up into the play of climate policy, uh, those three major economies uh, have a lot to exchange on. And although there may be political sensitivities around trade, uh, what we can expect to see is trade around green uh, across those economies. So something to look, uh, look out for. Thanks, Rathin. Um, actually, I've, before I go, give over to Gianfranco, um, two quick questions. Uh, but actually, one quick and one maybe a little bit longer one. First, again, another definitional question. Uh, what, is there a difference between green bonds and climate bonds? Very good question. Um, essentially, let's say that with the label, it really does indicate what's being financed. So, of course, if you see a climate-labeled bond, then that's indicating to the investment community that that is a bond that is linked very much to uh, assets that will contribute positively to climate mitigation or adaptation and resilience, keep in mind. Um, however, green also fundamentally, if we look at the numbers of the market, uh, predominantly that is all assets that contribute um, uh, more so to climate, but it also allows for other types of um, uh, investments such as uh, biodiversity, environmental restoration uh, projects, assets that may not have a clear direct link to climate mitigation, but of course has other environmental positive objectives. Thanks for that. And I can, you can see this is a new topic for many of us. So uh, that's why we get these questions. Please, I'm, very, please. I'm very grateful for you to answering them. But actually, let me get another question. So I, am, uh, I know, Jane Franco, I'm, uh, I'm making your wait here. But um, you mentioned EIB. Uh, I think you mentioned the World Bank. I don't think I heard you mention central banks. What is the role of central banks? I know this is a big question. And the ECB, oh, right. at least on Twitter, has come out quite strongly in favor of a role of the... Of, uh, oh, the central <laughs> banks. This In the last two years, the central banks have really taken me aback. Pers I, I am absolutely amazed at the step up of action that's that, and, and more so commitments. The implementation side, of course, is the challenge. But ECB... Uh, even recently, we've heard the announcements coming from the feds now, uh, given in light of the change of administration, 
Um, and if we also look even in the emerging markets and PBOC, of course, was the one that stepped up first to put in a China's green catalog together. Um, in the ASEAN space, we've got uh, uh, Malaysian Central Bank, um, the Singaporean Central Bank, all in, uh, recognizing that the stuff that NGSF is putting out, so NGSF is the uh, network for greenness of financial system of which it comprises about 60 plus central banks around the world very strong recommendation reports coming out on how they play a role in climate risk mitigation mm -hmm. uh, to, to sustain the financial system. And we've had, uh, even in the emerging market, central banks putting out recommendation reports that align with the NGSF. So I would say that in the next five years, we're going to see huge momentum behind the central banks because the central banks, everything is about risk. And this is about recognizing that we, we do have serious risk if we don't address climate. So um, monetary policy from the central banks is going to be very interesting in the years ahead. Okay, well, thank you very much, Justine. Uh, let me turn over to Gianfranco, which um, who's, I think is going to shed us some uh, maybe doubts, uh, but definitely some lights on uh, different shades of, uh, of green or greenish ones. Please, Gianfranco. Thank you very much. Um, my apologies, my presentation is not as appealing uh, uh, as Justine's one. So uh, I would like to, to share with you uh, this, uh, uh, this work uh, that is uh, um, uh, uh, a joint work with my colleague, Marco Spinelli. Um, let me uh, sort of, to, in order to, um, to sort of give a framework, a context for, for this research, let's uh, maybe touch on uh, what the, uh, what academia, what scholars are uh, thinking and of, of green bonds. So uh, right now, uh, I will say that there is a, a pretty well-developed body of uh, empirical and theoretical uh, sort of literature about uh, green bonds. And I will say that the three main areas that have been uh, sort of studied by uh, scholars are the pricing of uh, green bonds versus uh, similar non-green bonds, the ownership pattern for green bonds, and then the consequences for the issuers of emitting green bonds. Uh, the majority of the empirical studies actually find a greenium in the sense of a green premium in both the primary and the secondary market, which means that basically the, uh, the, the return that uh, those, those bonds pay are lower than uh, similar bonds uh, with uh, um, similar characteristics except for uh, the, the greenness. And this greenium appears to be, uh, let's say, on average between minus one and minus nine, uh, nine basis points, which is uh, uh, not uh, sort of a huge uh, premium, but still is something that uh, scholars have been able to quantify and uh, can be uh, considering uh, the, the, the size of, of green bonds as an asset class. This is an important sort of uh, quantity. However, this is sort of the big introduction, but I have to stress that the existence and uh, the size of the greenium are from, from settled in academia. Uh, for, for example, uh, just, just to mention a specific examples, uh, there are two uh, sort of uh, uh, brilliant papers that have been published on uh, US municipal bonds market. And so uh, there are uh, scholars that found uh, a significant greenium for uh, the US uh, municipal bonds market, making again th this distinction between uh, green bonds and, non and similar non-green bonds. And uh, more recent studies on the same, exactly same market basically find no, no, no premium at all. Uh, this is also the, the consequence of some empirical challenges from, from scholars uh, studying uh, the green bond, bond markets. The, the biggest one is probably the matching. So, how uh, can we uh, compare in a meaningful way uh, green bonds to bonds that have uh, uh, that also are somehow similar except for the greenness profile? Uh, there are several ways to do the, this matching, and of course, the choice of the, the approach can actually affect the, the, the result. 
the second aspect that is uh, worth stressing is that uh, uh, in general fixed income securities so bonds markets tend to be uh, somehow um, less liquid than other markets for for example equities and so uh, what we find uh, in the, in our empirical analysis the sort of the prices are somehow they, they tend to be biased especially for sort of the uh, the issue bond issues that are that are of a lower uh, sort of size and then uh, this is probably more related to, to the discussion we're going to have today is the definition of green bonds. What exactly is a green bond and what uh, a green bond is not? So these are the three main uh, sort of um, theoretical problems that have sort of consequences in, a, in, a, in the empirical analysis. So because uh, the green bonds have, have become so sort of, uh, I will not say mainstream, but definitely they are no longer just a, a small niche in the fixed income security markets. Uh, there is a growing interest about the role of certification and the verification of, of the greenness. And now there are several um, specialized organizations that are providing uh, an assessment of uh, the, the greenness credentials of, uh, of bonds. Uh, so there are ratings that are uh, specialized audit, audit reports and there are second opinions. Uh, one of the sort of uh, um, uh, methodologies to assess the greenness of bonds that uh, has, has become sort of more popular in, uh, in, in this market is the so-called shades of green uh, sort of methodology. So it's a way to measure the extent to which the projects that are financed via green bonds are fully consistent with the transition uh, towards a low carbon economy and a low carbon society. And typically there are uh, three sort of labels, three ratings if you want, or three shades. Uh, there are the dark green bonds. These are, uh, should, should be considered the, the bonds with the highest climate credentials because they are uh, sort of able to finance projects that address climate in the short term and in the long term and also include some uh, uh, sort of not only uh, on, on the mitigation uh, um, aspects, but also on the adaptation assets. Medium have a sort of uh, less good credentials in the sense that usually they, they target short term uh, climate issues and some long term climate issues. And the light are the ones that uh, typically provide a short term solutions. For example, uh, the project is going to reduce the carbon footprint in the in the short term, but there is no uh, apparent evidence of uh, the, the project to sort of uh, uh, remain sustainable and uh, uh, sort of uh, climate resilient in the long term. So dark green bonds are in, in a way the most interesting ones because the, these are the, the bonds that are green, the green bonds that are considered the, the most sort of uh, um, effective and uh, fully reflective of uh, the transition towards uh, a low carbon economy. So I would like to, to, to ask you, what, what is your feeling? Um, do you think that the market, the financial market cares uh, about the different shades of green uh, or not? Let's wait a few seconds more to collect your answers and then Okay, so the majority of you is uh, thinking that the uh, market care uh, market cares about the, the shades of green, uh, but there is a robust 37% who is a little bit more uh, skeptical. So let me show you what, what, what you've done here to uh, try to address these, uh, this question. Oh, sorry. Uh, so, uh, in order to, to test these, uh, these, uh, this, this question, we have uh, worked on uh, uh, the uh, second opinions issued by Cicero, which is a leading, uh, one of the pioneers and a leading provider of second opinions of green bonds. So, this uh, um, is an initiative that was created in, uh, um, in Scandinavia and uh, um, sort of with the involvement of uh, um, uh, 
uh, universities so it's it's considered um, sort of in terms of reputation one of uh, uh, really uh, the leaders in this field so we have worked on the second opinions issued by Cicero's which are publicly available online and uh, our sample basically consists of, consists of uh, 64 dark green bonds and the 74 medium and the light green bonds uh, so uh, we don't have time and probably there is not, not much interest to, to go into the technical details. So let's say that uh, each one of these bonds is matched with uh, brown bonds uh, that uh, share the, uh, or the same characteristics or the, uh, they are pretty close in terms of uh, size, uh, in terms of a kind of issuer, in, in terms of rating. The only exception is that these are brown bonds. So they, they, there is no uh, sort of uh, uh, green component at the moment of the issuance for the uh, proceeds of these bonds. This analysis has been carried out from 2013 to November 2020. And I'll, I'll give you uh, the, the results. So uh, we confirm- okay, can, I, um, Gianfranco, can I just jump in here? Because there's one question which I think is uh, relevant right now. How exactly do you sort these I mean, who decides what is dark and what is light and what is medium? Uh, you describe yes. the classification, but how exactly? I mean, there must be some kind of on the borderline, right? Uh, yes, uh, here we, we rely on the, the Cicero assessment. So Cicero issues a, this is a second opinion that you can okay. think of it as a, a rating. So it basically says uh, this bond given on the analysis we have carried out is a dark green bond in the sense that the proceed on the basis of the documentation we have and the commitment of the issuer, the proceeds are going to be used to uh, build a renewable uh, power plant that has all the feature to sort of uh, uh, reduce the um, CO2 emissions in the short term and the long term. So uh, uh, this is exactly the job of Cicero. So uh, you should think of Cicero as a rating agency, basically. So instead of saying a triple A, uh, double B or C, they are just saying in terms of a, um, sort of a climate impact, climate footprint, this is a dark green uh, bond. So it means that is uh, fully consistent with uh, 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 the, the pathway to a, a low carbon economy. Um, so, uh, Coming back, hopefully I addressed the question. Uh, coming back to, to, the, to the quantification of the premium, what we find is that uh, the, the, uh, the greenium, so the premium for uh, the especially dark green bonds is uh, of four basis points. Uh, but is, this is not statistically significant. So uh, we cannot really say that uh, dark green bonds are priced differently from uh, uh, brown bonds that are, that are similar. Uh, to give you ju just a flavor of our finding from, from, from a graphical point of view, uh, we have a, a here the graph on the, uh, on, on the left that is a sort of the monthly median dark uh, green premium. And uh, as you can say, is uh, uh, more or less uh, close to zero. On the contrary, for uh, uh, the light green and the, uh, the medium green uh, bonds, we see that there is an interesting sort of, uh, of, of, of pattern. And over time, actually, uh, the uh, sort of uh, medium light green bonds have become uh, more expensive uh, in, the, uh, in, the, in the market. Uh, so, uh, so the, the first answer to, to, to your, 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 the, the, the poll, to the question is, uh, no, the market actually uh, does not care. So we don't have enough sort of evidence to, to say that the market uh, uh, cares about the, 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 the shades of greenness of the bonds. However, there is another uh, interesting piece of information. We have also looked at the ownership of uh, uh, the bonds in, in our sample. And in particular, we have looked at the uh, the ownership by uh, investors who have signed to the United Nations Principle for Responsible Investments. And we have also uh, sort of looked more, more precisely at the sort of the, the stated uh, approach to climate investing of, of uh, uh, the investors who, who report to UNPRI. Uh, so I'll give you ju just some uh, very, very, very rough high-level indication of our finding. And our finding is that uh, uh, the bond ownership uh, is actually, by United Nations uh, PRI investors, is actually affected by the shades of green. 
So we find that uh, uh, for uh, dark green bonds, uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the percentage of owners who are sort of, let's call them a climate aware institutional investors is a significantly higher than uh, uh, the, the ownership of uh, conventional bonds. And the light, light, medium green bonds are basically treated like uh, um, uh, sort of non-green bonds at all uh, in terms of uh, institutional investors' ownership. So uh, uh, I, I want to uh, sort of uh, stress what are the limitations of, of these studies before sort of drawing definitive conclusions about our evidences. Uh, our sample is clearly, uh, clearly small. Uh, because here we are speaking of 64 dark green bonds and 74 uh, medium or light green bonds. Uh, and uh, this, this is a sort of a hurdle that is uh, difficult to, to, to sort of uh, pass. But, but uh, in, in terms of consistency, this is a sort of, uh, the, um, we are sure that the consistency of the methodology to to assess the, the shades of green is, uh, uh, is robust. So uh, as we will say in, in academia, the, the data is internally uh, consistent. Um, second point, um, again, here um, in a finance of economics research, we are a little bit obsessed with the causality. So uh, is the second opinions that are actually affecting, for example, the ownership configuration? Um, we cannot claim that is because of the second opinions, because it might well be that institutional investors who have a, a, an analyst team, a internal analyst team that uh, decides which bonds to purchase, carry out their own due diligence. And so it's not because of the second opinions per se, it's just that the analysts look at the uh, uh, the bond issues, and they sort of uh, prefer to buy the, uh, uh, the the bonds that have uh, the sort of the strongest expected impact impact in terms of uh, uh, climate uh, footprint. Um, so our, our results can, should not be read as a sort of uh, uh, necessarily a, as a sort of. A, a, uh, cow, um, sort of uh, determinant role of the second opinions per se. But the, the final takeaway for, 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 this, uh, for this exercise is that uh, uh, the market in general does not seem to care about the shades of green in terms of uh, pricing. However, the ownership of, uh, um, of a green bonds, it does appear to be affected by the quality of the uh, expected carbon and climate footprint of uh, the project that are financed uh, uh, via green bonds. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Gianfranco. Um, exciting results. Um, now, a couple of uh, questions I have, um, and also a couple of questions that are in actually in the in the in the, in the Q and A box. I again encourage everybody to use use the Q and A box and not the, the chat. Um, I mean, you use the Cicero data or Cicero data, um, but I, the one thing that uh, we've seen in the market is there's now a, a plethora of different kind of uh, um, indices popping up or kind of rating agencies popping up for all things green. Um, is that an issue or would you, would you expect to find different things if you use a different uh, kind of indices? Uh, yeah, I mean, um, um, uh, personally, and I'm speaking really on a personal level, I'm really skeptical about most of uh, the sustainability data that is currently available in the market. Uh, and uh, um, th th I mean, this is, this is, this is apparent from, from our analysis from our everyday life. Uh, there is a, an interesting paper that um, has been just published by MIT scholars that mm -hmm. sort of uh, look at uh, the, um, the, not only the quality of the data, but the fact that for many providers, the data uh, keep getting updated again and again. So uh, if you think of the carbon footprint of a given company last year, uh, this is probably going to change on a daily basis this because they are uh, re sort of repopulating this data very frequently. So there, there is even if you just pick just one source of data, there is not even data stability. So uh, um, yeah. so definitely this is the, the, the biggest hurdle for, for, for people who do research, but also for, for people who actually have to, to make business decisions for the investors and for policymakers. The yeah. data are really uh, not uh, uh, trustable, reliable uh, as they are right now. 
okay. which get, uh, creates a lot of opportunities for uh, companies and investors who want to greenwash to basically uh, present that themselves as uh, champions of uh, greenwashing, uh, even if they are basically doing nothing or they are uh, opportunistically uh, picking the metrics that uh, uh, allow their portfolio to, to, to really not change. Uh, mm. while still having some uh, some material to, to to present themselves as sustainable investors. Yes. Thank you, Gianfranco. So now let's let me turn back to Justin. And I think actually it, uh, just the results of the study themselves. So yes, uh, invest institutional investors care about them, uh, about dark versus uh, medium versus light, but it's not reflected in any prices. Now, so my first question, what, what is your reaction? What, uh, how, I mean, is that something, um, a market failure? Is it something that will go away over time? And of course, the second question um, related to what Gianfranco just said. I mean, uh, uh, what do we do with all of these indices? Is that uh, just um, uh, has to be shaken up? Uh, do we need uh, government intervention here, EU intervention to get to a reasonable index to kind of avoid this, uh, this greenwashing as Gianfranco just referred to? So I think to the first point, Thurston, this is about uh, supply and demand. And that's why you don't see at this stage a price to be able to differentiate between dark and light green. Uh, the level of demand on the investor side cannot be underestimated here. Uh, there is so much demand that there's not enough supply to meet it, mm. um, which essentially from the research that uh, CBI, my market intelligence team has done over the past three years, uh, year on and year end, there continues to start being an increase in price differential uh, between green bonds and regular vanilla bonds. In the early analysis, it was just proving that green bonds were being treated uh, as good, cr credible quality product as much as vanilla bonds. Now we're beginning to see the spread. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one point. Um, it, from uh, anecdotal data that we have uh, through the issuer network uh, who've been engaging in this market, um, every single one of them reports in a uh, price differential. Um, oversubscription is the norm. Uh, and of course, bonds more generally in the market are doing well, um, but green bonds is, is, is one that, again, investors are hungry for. Um, a lot of that is because of the ESG and green and social and sustainability uh, mandates that are being set at the investor level. Um, and, and there were a couple of questions around what does dark green mean? Uh, does that mean tied to the rating? And I just want to be very clear, it absolutely does not. Uh, it comes down to what's being financed. And so when we talk about dark green, we're talking about assets that are without question contributing to a low carbon economy. These are things like wind assets, solar assets, for example. Nobody's going to sit and have a debate whether those are low carbon or not. Um, but where things become light is uh, areas that could be questionable, um, such as hydropower projects uh, that are operating in sensitive areas. Uh, it could be um, you know, gas investments that are uh, being used in uh, the transport sector. Uh, and although there's an environmental advantage there, um, there's also still an effect of, of, of emissions. And, and, and a lot to do with why the dark and green has come about is because of the lack of supply uh, and creating more opportunity uh, to bring issuance into the space. Mm -hmm. uh, now, this does not necessarily mean that it's stuff that's just being wrapped up in green and all shiny and glossy. Now, that comes down to um, the way in which these bonds are being reviewed, which I think is also could be dedicated in an entire webinar on its own. Um, you know, there is check in on what this stuff is now, whether one wants to debate about whether the verification certification model is better than an SPO, we could have that. Nonetheless, it's important that our listeners know that this is not self declared product. This is stuff that is going through a due diligence that, um, you know, may be uh, debatable on to the level of that, but investors are making decisions off of that due diligence. Hmm. Um, and then, of course, the indice uh, side of things, look, that's the direction of travel we're going. Um, uh, at this stage, uh, CBI's market intelligence team uh, provides, we're the largest holder of green bond data globally. We've moved into sustainability labeled products, social products, and so on, and building those databases. 
We make screens on what we include through a methodology built around uh, our CBI taxonomy, which is Paris aligned and cross cutting among sectors and decisions in that feeds into the indices. That's what the indices rely on at this stage uh, has been CBI data. So, um, but nonetheless, there's still a lot of work to be had on that side and um, uh, getting an index in place, I think is the direction that we're going in. Can I just uh, follow, quickly follow up? So you mentioned just kind of the labeling side and uh, the, the, all the, the care that goes into the labeling. But what about exposed? What about enforcement? If, um, so this is one question here, um, once a pro specific project is funded by a green bond issuance and is on the surface compliant, that these investments are being actually carried out in line that's with the guidelines? a very good question. And that's the fundamental difference between having a second party opinion and having a third party verification with a certification on the back of it. Mm. Um, the uh, post, pre and post issuances is, is key to the overall label. Um, second party opinions start and stop at the pre-issuance. Um, it then relies on the issuer to ensure that it will stay committed to its reporting year on year and it makes sure that the funds actually get allocated to what's said on the TIN. Mm. Um, the certification has a governance model around it. Um, this is the Climate Bond Standard Certification Scheme, uh, which has 34 trillion assets of management under its board. Uh, that overlooks the, um, uh, at the pre-issuance, it's the setup and certification is granted at that stage. But once funds are allocated, the verifier comes back in to check on the post-issuance to ensure the funds are being allocated accordingly. Um, and that, that is the, the fundamental difference there. Um, of course, there's claims from the SPO models that, that they do do that, but there's very little evidence to that. And investors, do struggle with uh, now that the market size is reaching its capacity, uh, that it is, that there's that oversight that's in place. And that's when the EU side becomes very interesting because when it starts to move into a regulatory environment, um, what does that actually look like? So if the taxonomy is pulled into regulation, that's giving the sort of um, rules of the game in terms of metrics and what can be included. Um, that's Paris aligned, but the th question is who's checking this stuff that making sure and, and I think that's a, uh, a discussion in, in the Commission right now. Okay, well, thank you. Um, let me turn over to uh, uh, Gianfranco. Um, uh, I mean, in your sample um, of green bonds, I mean, out of general, um, what about green bonds that are not issued exactly by green firms? I mean, think about chemical industry or so. I mean, um, um, how do we think about them? Um, would, would, they, would institutional investors look differently at them than at green bonds um, uh, funded um, by clearly green companies? Well, yes, I mean, uh, I think that, you know, uh, green bonds that are issued to sort of improve the industrial process uh, of uh, sort of uh, polluting by definition industries like steel or chemicals, uh, definitely uh, they, are, they are unlikely to get a dark green uh, sort of rating. That's, uh, um, th th that's very unlikely, uh, unlikely. But um, so th they will they will not probably uh, if if our results can be generalized, mm -hmm. they uh, will basically trade more or less uh, as uh, the um, conventional uh, uh, bonds, and they will not sh uh, sort of attract uh, sort of climate aware institutional investors. That 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 will be sort of the consequence of uh, generalizing uh, uh, our results. Um, if, if that is a good thing for, for the economy and the transition towards a low carbon economy, that's then is another question. Because yeah. probably even if is, we are just reducing um, uh, marginally the, uh, the sort of the, the carbon footprint, then I mean, if this is a generalized effort, probably uh, that could represent a, a good contribution to the, to, the, to the transition towards a low carbon economy. Okay, thanks. Um, Justine, um, you mentioned earlier these different attempts across the globe to, uh, to kind of set standards. Um, and I mean, we've seen this in other cases and actually uh, on a side note in, in London, we, uh, there's always this discussion that uh, the UK after Brexit will not be able to send its own standards, but that's a different discussion. But so is that, um, uh, I mean, GDPR, for example, for privacy, uh, Europe has kind of taken a big step and uh, might force other countries to follow uh, suit. Can you see something similar uh, in the space of uh, green finance, specifically green bonds that um, 
uh, that the EU will kind of um, be able to set uh, kind of global standards or will there be kind of competing standards from, I don't know, US, um, uh, Europe and China again? Um, I think it's already happening. I think um, uh, for our audience to understand the market developments that are happening, um, the China put their catalog out in 2016. Uh, and in 2020, they revised it where the fundamental difference there was removing coal assets from the catalog as a um, uh, area of qualification for green finance. Um, of course, they've also been paying very close attention to the developments that have been happening out of the EU. Uh, why? Because they want to ensure that they can continue to access uh, European buyers for their own green bonds issuances that happen. So alignment will be critical. So the harmonization effect between the EU and China is on its way. Um, the US will take a very fundamentally different approach. It's a different economy entirely, and it will definitely not be looking to the EU to set what it needs to do domestically. It will be interesting to see how the US comes into this space um, that is yet to be determined. But the rest of the world in the emerging markets, particularly across LATAM uh, and the Southeast Asia region plus three uh, are paying attention because they know that between those two major economies that has a very uh, significant effect on the direction uh, flows of capital. Um, for green. So there is a lot of development that's happening now uh, in all the regions I just mentioned on developing national taxonomies, uh, looking to the experience uh, and uh, areas of, of the taxonomy that the EU has put out and looking to see where things can be adopted and where there may be challenges. Um, but it's also an opportunity for those countries to also feed back uh, to those uh, in, in the international on, especially in the land use space and others, um, uh, there's, there's opportunity to expand even what we have in the EU. So I think what we're, we're, we're moving towards to finish is a harmonization effect. It's not to say that what the EU puts out, everybody will adopt, it's mm -hmm. impossible, but it will definitely set an example uh, that will help other countries uh, get themselves, and the most important is that we're all aligned at a 1.5 degree trajectory in our investments that we are, we are proposing. Thank you. I have a question now for both of you, and that's actually, um, and I'm very grateful to Arjen Trinks for bringing this up because uh, it kind of brings us back to the very basic question. Um, what's the real world contribution of green bonds in terms of uh, contributing to the 1.5 uh, degrees uh, goal, for example. So the, specifically the question, what is the real world contribution of green bonds relative to CO2 reduction that are already being induced by government regulation or kind of tax schemes, for example? Um, well, so what is, um, I mean, what additional effect can be observed or can we expect, or can be observed or can we also expect in the future from green bonds compared to other policies that can be pushed? Maybe, um, not sure, Jacin, you want to start or Jim Franco? Sure. Um, I will say that fundamentally green bonds are about getting governments to act. Um, the, it's not obvious what the additionality is, but let me list out some. Um, one is coordination uh, uh, internally across ministries, or if we're talking about corporates and companies, green bonds is getting people to start talking. Uh, and it's getting departments to interact and communicate effectively. It's about um, not enough public sector money to address the urgency that we all have. Uh, and Green Bonds is serving as that Trojan horse uh, to match the capital to the investments required. Um, it has also served fundamentally as an education tool in these last 10 years about organizing the market uh, getting it uh, properly organized to really scale up. So although we may have a debate about the impact of green bonds to date and so on, what we have achieved in less than 10 years because of green bonds mm -hmm. and what we've seen with all the regulatory around you know, climate and it is fundamentally, it's because we've managed to figure out how we actually tap that institutional capital. Um, so that's what I, that's how I would, uh, that. Thank you, Gianfranco. Uh, yes, so uh, I, um, 
I'm not aware of any study that uh, provides a quantification of uh, how much the channeling so towards sort of uh, green assets is going to help in uh, the world achieving the, the goals that, uh, that, that make sense in order to survive. Personally, again, uh, take it as just a personal opinion. I am, uh, um, uh, to a certain extent, a bit skeptical about the role of uh, climate finance. I don't know, I am a scholar in climate finance. I think that there, there is a, somehow a trend uh, according to which because uh, politics and governments are not able to take action in a decisive a timely uh, ma uh, manner then there is this idea that institutional investors and the central banks should take care of the problem i personally don't think this is the the best and the most effective solution i think that uh, uh, this is the job of the governments with the price that especially in democratic societies this uh, uh, would entail to sort of uh, take action that are really really meaningful and uh, and, and timely and uh, if this happens there would be no need for for green bonds at all because all the bonds would be green by definition <laughs> yes of course yes. so this is my, my my personal sort of heretical view view of, of, of the problem of the situation you're, you're kind of describing the perfect world and uh, justine kind of sees it more as a tool to actually get uh, to this perfect world so i kind of uh, kind of like that <laughs> by the way in the chat just to mention this uh Thorsten Ehlers from uh, the bis just put a link to a paper uh, that answers exactly the question that I just, uh, I haven't looked, seen this paper, so, um, but uh, uh, for participants, maybe you want to uh, push this out, uh, um, check this out. Sorry, Chen Pangu, I was interrupting you. <clears throat> no, no, um, that, that, that was basically, meant, I mean, definitely they, they help. I mean, uh, uh, change, framing the discussion, uh, popularizing the, the idea of uh, uh, the, the role of uh, the importance of greening assets, greening societies, but uh, um, again, in an ideal world, that there should be something that the government should do, not the central yeah. bankers. Yeah. Okay, let me ask one last question. We're getting to the end of the, the top of the hour. Um, actually, kind of a two-sided question, two, two-part question. One is, we talked about green bonds, but of course, there are, this is only part of green finance. I mean, how do you compare green bonds with green loans or other forms of uh, green finance? Um, number one. And number two, I mean, where do we go from here? What, what do you see the green bond market or green finance market in general in 10 years? I mean, are we going to get to a point where, for example, institutional investors, pension funds have to invest at least 10% in these bonds? So they're going to kind of be minimum standards, even either privately kind of uh, enforced or maybe even publicly enforced. So where, where do we see this going? Maybe I turn first again to Gianfranco and then uh, give the final word to Justin. Uh, I mean, I think that the integration of uh, uh, sustainability criteria, not, not just green, in the, in the way uh, commercial banks uh, make loans uh, can have really, uh, uh, potentially have a very important consequences because it's going to sort of reach uh, companies and uh, issuers that are not, for example, in the um, uh, cap and trade system yet because they are uh, relatively small so the, the, that's definitely something that can can, can sort of help uh, towards the, the, this transition mm -hmm. um, so uh, and I think th this is happening I, th I think that uh, we have already some examples for for example uh, the UK is uh, um, a very good one with the, the, the central bank sort of expecting now all the, the UK banks to, uh, to to have a to have a strategy at board level about the integration of climate in uh, mm -hmm. uh, in uh, in the way that they they, 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 they give credit so that's that's probably a, is a promising area and my take is that uh, potentially can be even more important than the green bonds themselves. So the, the, the integration in of uh, these aspects in the lending policies, because mm -hmm. again, can reach uh, uh, companies and issuers that are not uh, sort of large enough, but that then, then they have a very important carbon footprint that could be potentially uh, very useful. Okay, thank you. Justin, um... How do we go forward? So why do you see the market in 10 years? And maybe also, uh, again, a question that has popped up several times. What's uh, what's the role of your institution going forward? Um, I think, look, I think that um, in the next 10 years, we're going to see the capital increasingly demanding sustainable investments. And they're going to be expecting a lot more. And I think for... Uh, 
sectors, businesses, and even governments that are not meeting that, access to capital is be going to become more restrictive. Mm. And I think that's what we're going to see in the next 10 years. And that will fundamentally, uh, it's just going to be a different place of where we're going to be in the next 10. If I look back at the last 10 years of where we were and where we are now, mm. uh, nobody was even discussing climate in the same way that it is now. And the money is moving and demanding. Uh, of course, nowhere near where we need to be or fast enough, but nonetheless, we've seen a shift. Um, and you know where CBI sits in this place is that we've been really driving this market um, from all different ways. I mean, it's a lot about supporting getting the market infrastructure in place to support growth. It is about education on what this market's about and why it's important and the need to move the capital urgently. Um, and it's supporting all different market participants to engage and, and participate. So, you know, we are an organization that is uh, global. Uh, we have been fundamental in the development of what is green um, around the world. We have been instrumental in putting out market intelligence to help inform the market. And of course, uh, our policy uh, and our standards work has helped to support markets. Um, and we will continue to do that uh, in, the, in the years ahead. Um, so yeah, that's, that's us in a nutshell. Great, thank you very much. So I'm afraid um, uh, the hour's up. Uh, Gianfranco, Justine, thank you so much. There were lots of questions in the chat. I apologize on the Q&A box, uh, also in the chat. I apologize to everybody whose question we could not answer today. Um, but I think um, given the interest and given the discussion, I think that's not the last time we're going to talk about this topic. Um, that's uh, going to be a, an important issue going forward, uh, also in our online seminars. And of course, again, to remind you of the, uh, uh, the climate risk uh, uh, academy that we're going to have in a, in a few months. Um, again, thank you both, um, Gianfranco, Justine, for your presentations, for uh, your discussion, and thank you for all the uh, attendees for their active participation with uh, uh, questions and comments. Thank you, and I hope to see you soon again. Thank you.